No, not to get things no. to you um, Can you introduce Neil Watson? He's a senior partner at Evolve Banking. And he's been a sysadmin in Arctic for over 20 years in finances, telecom, manufacturing, software development. He has a blog, watson-wilson.ca, which is quite popular, technometer. And he's a recognized expert in CFP and in CF engine. So we will make a presentation on how to make CF engine simple with EFL and does the reporting. Quick poll. How many have used the offending? <laughs> sort of. Version three or two? Two. How many have used Puppet? Couple. Chef. Anything else? Ansible salt. Another little thing. How many know what CF Engine is? How many don't? <laughs> How many don't know what CF Engine is? All right. Welcome to IT. <laughs> it's a fun ride sometimes. When you joined IT, was it what you expected? When I first started, I was pretty excited. And uh, then something Stop calling me. Stop calling me. Uh, I ran into a lot of repetition. I had to manually repeat things. Even stuff I scripted, I still ended up having to babysit it one way or another. And then finally, an enemy emerged. The real enemy was uncontrolled change. We provision our servers nicely, we build them just so, and then what happens? Somehow or other they change. I worked at one financial institution, and they had this great customer-facing web application that was giving them help. So they asked me to help them out. They gave me this giant book prepared by the original vendor who built it for them, which was very well documented. The problem was it was six years old and no one knew what had happened between then and now. But there's hope. And that hope is configuration management, which is essentially infrastructure as code. Everyone can hear me back there, yes? Cool. So configuration management allows you to express your infrastructure as code. How you want your servers to be configured, how you want your configuration files, what processes you want running, um, what commands to run and when, what packages are installed, how much disk space you have. All these things can be expressed as code. And then if your system is different from what you've expressed, configuration management will change the system back to what you want. So instead of wondering what those 6,000 servers are doing, because you really don't have time to go and check them all, configuration management will automatically check them all for your regular intervals without human intervention. Uh, since no one knows what CF Engine is, I'll stop for a minute or two and discuss it. CF Engine is a declarative language. It's a client-server application where the agent sits on your servers and it reads a declarative language similar to what you see here. The agent reads a language and determines whether or not the system is in compliance. If it's out of compliance, it uses its own internal already known libraries of functions and procedures that it has to do in order to find out, in order to change your system back to the desired state. So if you look at our example here, it's relatively simple. Uh, it's called, a, in CF Engine parlance, it's called a promise. 
So we're promising that the shadow file has the permissions 400, the owner is root, and the group is root. The handle is merely another attribute that's just a, uh, a documentary one, as well as the infosec hardening is another piece of documentation. I'm not going to go too deep in the syntax, but so you get the idea of how it works. So what we have there is a uh, the shadow file is what's called the promiser. On the right hand of that, which is called the promisee, that's who they're making the promise to. So in this case, we're making it to the information security team. And everything below that are attributes, attributes about the promiser. For instance, the handle I use to identify this promise from all others. And permissions attribute. Each type of promise does different things. You'll notice that it's not a scripted procedure. It's an end state we're describing. CF Engine knows the procedures it needs to reach that end state by itself. It doesn't need your help. That's probably the biggest hurdle that people have with most configuration managements, <coughs> not just CF Engine, is you're not doing scripting anymore. You're declaring what you want, just your end state. Common when you first start your configuration management, you don't realize it's called configuration management. You're essentially writing scripts, scripts that put things in order how you want them. Usually at the beginning, all that is is that's when you originally provision the machine, when you first install it. You have a kickstart file, you have a pre C, you have a jumpstart, whatever your system is. And you have all these little custom scripts you add on the end to make your machine just the way you want it. The problem is that's a one-off operation. It never happens again. Later on, you end up writing a bunch of taking those original scripts and you transfer them to the machines and you bunch, bunch, put a bunch of cron jobs in for a complex command and control SSH system that applies them regularly. The problem with that is, of course, it's all a whole bunch of custom code that no one understands but you. And the other problem is it doesn't scale very well. Because now you're trying to command and control a whole bunch of things. And you're also stressing the server a lot. Because most scripts do stuff no matter what. They're always writing to that file. Because no one ever writes it, so it checks the file. The thing about CF Engine is that it tests before it changes. So it will look at that file and it will say, is that file permit mode 0400? Yes, no. If yes, do nothing. If no, then correct it. Most scripting I've seen when they first started, they just blindly do a change model all the time. So in Unix, you can express things. Most things are expressed in terms of files, processes, and commands. Almost everything you can imagine in the Unix system is expressed using those three things. Even something like an installed package is essentially a commands promise. You're promising to run a command package manager that will put that package in. Or if you're checking to see if the package is installed, just checking the file or perhaps running the command. If you can express your configuration of your system in all these things, there's really nothing in it that you can't be prepared for. You can't configure and even do types of self healing. So we saw a promise briefly. So as you can imagine, you have a lot of those. A lot of them. You're promising file permissions, you're promising to delete files, you're promising to put the contents of certain files in, you're promising to start processes, you're promising to kill processes, add or remove commands, disable or enable boot up times, all these things together. You make up a lot of promises, a lot of code. All together in CF Engine parlance, and I think in the others too. They call this the policy, the configuration management policy.
even distributing your promises, your policy. It's just another promise. So in CF Engine, it says a client server application. The server doesn't actually make any decisions for the agents. The agent does that all on its own. The server is a file server. What happens is the agents are told to check with the server, do you have new policy for me? If so, then it downloads it and runs it. If not, it continues to work on the existing policy it has. One of the major advantages to this is your systems can repair themselves autonomously. It has network problems. The server is down. If it's broken so that it can't communicate with the server, any of these things can be repaired because the, server, the agent has all the policy it needs locally. No system is perfect. CF Engine is certainly no exception. <coughs> the most common complaint to CF Engine is it's hard. It's very hard to learn at first. It has a new syntax you have to learn. If you're coming from two to three, you have to learn all new syntax, entirely different. And the idea of going from uh, procedural languages that everyone knows and loves to something declarative, for many people, especially system administrators who don't do a lot of development, really hurts your brain. It kind of reminds me of when I took calculus in school. First, your brain explodes, but eventually you kind of get it. That didn't turn out quite right, but sort of. Uh, the other problem is the syntax, as I mentioned, is quite complex. What I showed you there was a very small promise with only a couple of attributes. I can show you much larger ones. And you have promises for files, uh, processes, commands, packages, uh, classes, variables, uh, something very strangely called methods, um, environments for setting up uh, virtual machines, uh, databases, probably a few others that I've never used. It can get quite complicated. And uh, many people leave CF Engine early because they just can't figure it out at first. Is that a CF Engine utterance? No, that's that actually Perl? supposed to be a, it was actually supposed to be a, uh, a Perl obfuscation contest as, an, as a funny example, but for some reason this computer blew it up on me. Okay. But I have some CF Engine code that can look similar to that. Line noise. Yeah. <coughs> so the evolved pre-promise pre library grew out of me being lazy. I got sick of writing the same CF Engine code over and over again, just slightly different to do different things. And I began to see much greater patterns in the code that people have already written. And that instead of writing one block of code to promise a DNS server, another block of code to promise an HTTP server, another block of code for an MTP service, they're actually all the same. All I have is a configuration file or two have a process that should be running, and have a command that restarts the process if it's not running or if I've changed the configuration. If I can write one bundle to do all those things, then all I have to do is change the parameters. And that's what EFL is. It's a large collection of pre-written CF Engine promises, and it takes separated plain text parameter files. The agent reads the parameter files, applies them to the EFL policy, puts them into CF Engine policy, and the agent runs them all for you. One of the nice things about this is you actually don't have to read and write CF Engine policy very much. You end up just reading and writing the parameter files, which makes your learning curve a lot shallower. Sorry, the, the technical that you used 
what about about the P? For 0, 0, this is what has permission to read that file, and other people don't. Correct. Uh, but doesn't Linux already have it embedded in its file system? So the question is, doesn't the system already know that the shadow file is mode 400? If systems always stay in one condition, probably none of us would be here. Systems drift. They drift because people go in and do things, sometimes for good intentions, sometimes naive intentions, sometimes there are software bugs. All these things can make your system change unexpectedly. Also, if you work in a place that involves uh, security audits, it's not enough to say that this file, when it was installed, was this permission. The security auditor will say, prove it is now. How do you know what it is now? You knew it was when you installed it, but you don't know what it is now. You have to know these things. So this is where something like configuration management helps. Because it doesn't just apply at once. Every time it runs, CF engine update every five minutes. Every five minutes, it will check, it can check that file and say, is the permissions correct, yes or no? If not, I'll fix it. So you know continuously that the system is exactly what you expect it to be. I'm surprised that the owner of the file probably makes it available to everyone, but if you are supposed to, the system can go up very quick and change it right to what it was. That's correct. If the system changes because an owner does it for some reason, and this wasn't supposed to, uncontrolled change, then the system will change it back. Okay. What they call uh, repairing. The system will, will let's see if engine calls it as a repair. Does it do any monitoring to discover how the damage got created? Not out of the box. You could probably configure it to do it, but I'm not sure how well it would work that way. So do these promises run like like you say every five minutes? So you have, you know I can imagine you know, a busy system of lots of them, maybe thousands. So they all percolate through and check everything. All the permissions are right. Files are this. They can do the question is do the promises run? Do all the promises run every five minutes? Potentially at getting at loading the system. Is that what you're worried about? Well, I'm just just sort of wondering. Like they're all trivial, no problem. But they, they're doing a lot of work. And, yes, you know. some promises can can handle the system quite a lot. Uh, there's a, a, a concept called locking in CF Engine, which means every promise by default can't run more than once a minute. So, so go ahead. I'm getting there. So if you were to if you were an impatient person and ran the agent by hand, like bam bam right after another, it wouldn't check the same promise over and over again. I would say, oh, I checked this promise. 30 seconds ago, I'm going to skip it and go on to the next one. So can it be intelligent? Like, like let's say you are looking at permissions on your et cetera shadow file. OK. And you maybe got a whole bunch of other things, password, who knows, all sorts of other stuff in et cetera. So can it be intelligent and look at the, the modification date and time on the ETC uh, directory and then say, oh, that, that's changed, so I better execute all these promises to check all the contents of the ETC folder? Or does it mind as you have to go through and check all the hundreds of files you have there? You could write your policy to do that, but I'm not sure that I would trust the timestamp. Okay. So back to your original question of load, every promise has a lock on it, but you can change that lock to whatever you want. So you can say certain promises, I don't want you to check them more than once an hour or once a day, which means you can take your, your heavy stuff like package management and whatnot and set them out so they only do every few hours. And your simple stuff like checking file permissions, you can do every five minutes. Did, you want to specify time when the promise is checked? Like when? Like when? Yes, you can do, uh, simplest to run it as a time window. So you can say, you know, between 5 and 5.30, check this. Uh, I, I tend not to use time windows too much because I don't want it to. I don't want it to work like a cron because cron has its disadvantages in that you run it this minute and this minute only, and if it fails, nothing happens. 
whereas with CF Engine, we say, uh, I want you to run it when you can. You can give it a time window and then, and then in, so within the time window. And one of the things CF Engine does is uh, it knows when the last time it ran the promise and it knows what the condition was. So it can say, well, I ran this promise successfully. So I know that I don't need to run it again within this time window because it's already been done. Which means if it fails one time, it's still in the time window will try again. Which makes it more resilient. So back to the DFL, we talked about parameters. Well, if we go back to where our shadow promise, we had we have here a parameter file that works with file permissions. It's a similar to a CSV file. And we have a few columns there that define what it does. So we define uh, a class, which I'll get into later. Uh, there's our promiser file. Uh, the next three columns, recurse, leaf regex, and negate, have to do with, uh, I, could, I could do some sort of search or globbing to choose a whole selection of files if I wanted to. So every file in this subdirectory apply these permissions. Uh, and then after that is a uh, mode, the owner, and the group. And last is the promisee, which is a, a documentation of who the promise is for. These particular ones are referencing a hardening document from uh, the NSA's Red Hat Hardening Guide. Here's another one. This one enables systems using uh, check and fake. So it's similar. Except this time we only have three columns. So first we have the class for the context, which is when these when these promises are applied. The second one is the service that we're promising to enable. And the last one is again the promise that says who I'm making it to. Again, this is from a hardening policy. So this has to do with uh, hardening. I have one more here. And this promises sysctl kernel settings. Not just configuration file sits in etc, but the actual live settings. We'll check both at the same time. So again, we have context, the left-hand column. Then we have our variable and the value we're setting. And then lastly, again, we have the promise that tells us who we're setting it for. just a large list of the types of bundles that EFL library handles. So it handles uh, setting classes, which I'll talk about later, setting variables, uh, promising running services, disabling enabling services, promising the contents of files, the permissions of files, uh, killing unwanted processes, starting processes, Add or removing packages, uh, setting kernel set, setting kernel settings, deleting files, all these types of things you would do on an everyday system admin job. This can do. Questions so far? Okay. I know we talked about two products, but I'm going to talk about one more briefly. It's called Delta Hardening, and it works with EFL. What it is is a bunch of pre-written parameter files, like the ones I showed you. In fact, the ones I showed you are. What does that mean? Uh, do you want to just throw this on? I'm sorry. You can take any one of those off. What do you know? collection of pre-written promises, promise data that you can use. 
and they're based on uh, NIST and NSA server hardening guides, and there are more than 100 different areas where you can harden your servers. They include disabling and enabling services, file permissions, uh, kernel settings, service configurations, adding or moving packages, a lot of things that will get your servers in much better hardening position. All open source, all these three are all GPL, three. So CF Engine is nice in that it takes care of all your servers. One of the things CF Engine doesn't do out of the box is now you've applied it to all your servers, how do you wonder, is it working? You think it's working, I suppose you could spend a lot of time going out to each machine and auditing them periodically, doing some random sampling to see if it works. But I'm too lazy for that. I think it's just picking up the PA. So we created something called Delta Reporting, which is essentially a compliance log of all the promises that CF Engine does. What it does is, as the agent runs, it logs and collects all the promise outcomes that it performs. Delta Reporting collects all those logs from all your systems and puts them into a database where you can search them. So you're looking at the landing page there. And you can see that's just a quick dashboard that you see at the beginning. It tells me my health count. It gives me a ratio of promises that are uh, kept, repaired, meaning they're found to be off and then fixed, and not kept, which means they tried to repair them and couldn't. And then at the bottom there, you see the date. It tells me the last time I had a data capture. So if my data capture is late, you're going to know something about it. One of the reports is a promise, promise percent summary. And that gives us a shot over time of what our promises are doing, how many are kept, prepared, or not kept. So you can start to see trends. Only one person here knows what CF Engine is. So, or two. Can you tell me what a CF Engine class is? It's probably one of the hardest concepts of CF Engine. That's because when I say class, everyone thinks objects. It's not what it is. When I ask you why it's named this way, uh, some people try to call them a context, which sometimes makes more sense to certain people. What it is a class is a criteria that a system either meets or doesn't meet. So a criteria might be running a Linux kernel within a certain subnet, a type of Linux distribution, um, has a MAC address matching this. These are all classes that the system is or is not a member of. You also define your own classes. So you could say, all these servers, some sort of criteria, like maybe a subnet, maybe just a small range of IP addresses, are DNS servers. Or all these other servers are DMZ servers. When you have these, this classification, you're able to learn a lot more things about your environment. It also means that you can determine which promises are applied to which machines. So you don't want to apply everything to all your machines. You want to apply just stuff that is relevant to that particular machine. And classes are how you do that. One of the things you can do with Delta Reporting is you can query classes. These are all hard classes. It's just stuff that the agent figures out automatically on its own whenever it runs on the system. So I can do an inventory report. So I know how many systems I have, I know how many are Debian, I know how many are in a particular subnet. I can even search that list for longer than one page. I can even export it for uh, more formal reporting. I 
to do custom searches for classes. So let's say I have a class that says uh, I have a DNS server class. All my posts that are DNS. I can do a search. What you're seeing here is data from uh, our own environment, our own uh, production environment, actually. <clears throat> so here's a class report for uh, March. There's a time window between 2325 and 2330. What systems were members of the DNS server class? And I have three. That was a timestamp of when that class was last known to be true. I know their IP address, the host name, I even know what policy server they're running from. Here's a promise report. Promises are a little different than classes. We've already discussed promises. In this one, uh, I'm querying about SSH configuration. So I'm checking uh, the SSHD configuration file, uh, an SSH user directory, and uh, an SSH uh, user's authorized keys file. So I can see that all four promises were kept. I see when they were kept. Promise handle tells me exactly what promise they were that I can look for inside the code. And that tells me the host, the IP address, and the policy server. Another one there, similar for uh, CTL settings. Same thing, those are the promises that I wanted. I wanted those sysctl settings to be just so. That's my promise E for a IPv6 auto assignment. And those are the outcomes. I see that they're kept. So I know that I'm in compliance. And one more, or I can just say, show me stuff that's not kept. Could be a big list, might be a small. In this case, it's a pretty small list. I'm having problems with resolve.com. <clears throat> Let's try a live demo. So, demo dot evolve dot com. Password evolve, user evolve, password evolve. Anyone can try this. Here's what we saw earlier. Here's our dashboard. So our host count seven. We have the past 20 minutes or so, we have uh, 2,247 promises kept, 77 repairs. Trending graphs. What is the count of promises kept since uh, back in uh, late September to now, yesterday? In the bottom, we have a host count, which has been steady at seven the whole time. We see we have a trend line there, so we can know that by November, we're going to be a little bit higher. So maybe that's a good trend. We're going to have more promises kept. We also have one for promises not kept. That one comes around a bit. You see that's rising. That might be a concern. And another one for repair. That one's really rising. I also have test data on here, which is why this one jumps around a lot. We saw the inventory report. Pretty big. You even know stuff about the kernels. Missing shows me any hosts that I haven't seen in the past 24 hours. That one can be handy if you're trying to track down servers. You want to know whether or not they're all checking in like they're supposed to. And when you have thousands of servers, that can sometimes be challenging. This will help you a lot. Questions? Um, 
promises can fail because, well, sometimes user error, you just wrote the promise wrong. Sometimes because the system is in bad shape. So let's say uh, you wanted to promise the configuration file had certain um, contents, but the disk was full. So you couldn't write to it, keep that promise. Or let's say you promised that a package was supposed to be installed, the package manager isn't working, perhaps because the server is not ready, the, the central package server is not answering, or maybe the disk again is full. So the package manager can't determine whether or not the the package should be installed, has to fail. So if you were to have a promise fail, let's say uh, if you were trying to connect to your NFS to check something in a long time, does it execute all of the promises concurrently? So it would try one promise and then wait, and try the next one, or is it just do all of them? You can do both. You can configure the agent to run several in parallel, but some promises depend upon others, in which case it will have to be in series. Sometimes it can split off. You can say, well, this bundle, this set of promises has nothing to do with this set, so you can run them in parallel. The agent also has a timeout, which you can configure. It says, uh, if you haven't been able to verify this promise within a certain period of time, then just skip it and go to the next one. So that your agent is continuously hanging. Uh, Correct. Any questions? Other questions? Do they always run as root? Does it always run as root? Uh, typically, yes, because it has to be able to make promises to things that usually require root. It's one of those few services that really has to run root. Theoretically, you can run the server as a non-root. Uh, historically, it hasn't been done that way. I don't really know why. It's actually a good point. The service, the file server, probably should run as non-root. It could, it's just not typically done so. Uh, you can run the, the agent uh, separately as your own user to do certain things. Um, I have seen it where they have uh, two sets of policies in parallel. Uh, one standard root stuff, and another one entirely separate set of policies run by uh, run by like an application team where they're just promising things like Apache or Tomcat or something like that. So they can run their own policies, do whatever they want because their agent runs as their user, not root. Any other questions? Yes. How does it get along with SE Linux? How does it get along with SE Linux? How does anything get along with SE Linux? <laughs> Not well. Um, I can tell you that CF Engine so thus far hasn't had a lot of work done to make it work well with SE Linux. Uh, in the community, CF Engine community, a lot of people do have a few sets of promises that will do things like fix the files after it modifies them so that it still fits within the SE Linux promise or uh, SE Linux requirements. The name escapes me now. Context? Yes. Context, correct. So there are promises that will do that. People have written bundles that will do it. Uh, it doesn't do it out of the box, but it's not too difficult to make it do so. Any other questions? Yes. What do you think your library's main value is it is it distilled lore or is it backbreaking work you've done for somebody else or what how would you characterize what you've done there um, or systematize something people didn't understand very well in one way it, it's it's turned in one way it's kind of turned writing your own CF engine policy into more like an API where you just give it parameter files, mm -hmm. and you know, you know what to expect it will come out. Historically, uh, everybody wrote their own policy that did something. You get basically the basic framework, and then everybody had to write their own custom policy that did everything. And then several people in the community tried to start writing things that would make it easier so they didn't have to you know, reinvent the wheel every time you install TF Engine as an organization. So that's what EFL represents, is a way to take your knowledge that you know that your system should be and 
and put it into an engine that will already promise a 40. I'm just put it in there. And the question of delta hardening, that's, as you said, pre-existing lure that you can also use, plugs into the engine, makes a change for you. Does that answer your question? Probably as well as can be. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it helps make it a little more modular then? Yes, it, it makes it a lot easier to get going, to continually use it. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone. For coming.